Hello and welcome to the Raptors Weekly Podcast. I'm Mo Sampson Folk, and today, a three-man podcast. That's right. One more than the usual. I know we, we do a lot of two-man conversations here, or two-person conversations. But today, three men, ending in ums, Sampson, myself, Aiden Moss, Oren Weisfeld. And we're here to talk about basketball. Aiden of BenchBoss.ai fame, a great blog that he recently wrote about Thad Young. I thought it was great. Oren Weisfeld, he does the, uh, the wrap-up, the after-game YouTube live show. He writes for Raptors Republic. He writes a lot of places, but he's a, he's a humble man. So, Oren, Aiden, how are you guys doing today? I am well. Thanks so much for having me, dude. I'm very excellent. I'm, uh, I'm in St. John's, Newfoundland right now, enduring a blizzard. So I, I actually went through a blizzard yesterday. I'm in northern Ontario, and I okay. got snowed in. Good yeah. stuff. Well, it's called a squall, technically. That's the, that's the, the real nerds call it, but I'll say blizzard. It's cooler. If you were to meet somebody just in real life and they called something a squall, would you call them a nerd? I would say, like, probably. But, what like, nerds are, the, thing, the thing is, like, nerd shouldn't have such a negative connotation. Like, everyone who oh, we're watches here basketball already. this much, <laughs> <laughs> like, any one of us on NBA Twitter constantly tweeting stats, we're all nerds. We just have to accept it. That's especially with comic books and the typical comic book nerd thing. And now that comic book movies are basically the number one intellectual property as far as anything goes in the world and just how they are a worldwide phenomenon now, it feels like nerd has lost a lot of its punch. But the guy from Bleacher Report, he brought it back on the timeline for a little bit. So thank goodness for that. But Aiden, Newfoundland, how's that? No complaints. It's, a, it's been a... Uh... Uh, interesting experience. I'm in, originally from Victoria, BC, so I'm going island to island. Um, the rock. And a, yeah, that's right. One rock to the next. And um, it's a beautiful city. There's so much to do outdoors and uh, it's quiet, but there's lots of good food. I'm loving it. We're here to talk about basketball coming out of a squall and another person enjoying island life. So the Raptors, soon to be on the move would have been the case if anybody had been selected for All-Star Weekend. Two postponed games. One is supposed to be occurring, well, we're recording tomorrow, but for you, the listener, today, and the Raptors are trying to skirt some of the, uh, what would the term be, restrictions, trying to get past them to play a game closer, obviously with the back end of the schedule being hellish and a bunch of games stacked on top of one another, postponed games they project as something maybe a little bit problematic in relation to injuries. The Raptors with two of them, one of the three teams until they were postponed that didn't have anything to do with COVID postponing a game. That is no longer the case. But Fred Van Vliet, Pascal Siakam, Kyle Lowry, all, I would say, enjoying pseudo all-star seasons. And, you know, some to a higher degree, some to a lesser degree. But maybe Fred Van Vliet, the most notable snub is it and i'll ask this to you first aiden is it a blessing in disguise that the raptors don't have any all-star weekend participants given how many events parties that are going to go on during that weekend and that a lot of the players have shown a willingness to go out and party and do stuff like that yeah i mean look i'm not going to judge what people do in their off time and um you know, I, like, I'm not going to judge that the NBA is having an all-star game to begin with. I get, I was listening to Bomani Jones the other day, and I get that, you know, people got to get paid in, in the ways they know how. And the all-star game is a major moneymaker. Um, that being said, I don't think there's, you know, any utility for us, for us, uh, for, the, for any players to go there other than, you know, for their own image or their own notoriety. And we all know that the Raptors are never really going to get the respect they deserve. And I don't think sending a couple of um, players to the All-Star game is going to change that. So, you know, instead, they get to rest. Um, there's no potential for injury. There's no potential for COVID exposure. And most importantly, they keep that chip on their shoulder of not getting the respect they deserve. Oren, do you have any thoughts on this? I, you typically have thoughts on this kind of stuff. <laughs> Um, I actually don't have any really spicy thoughts. Like, I, I don't think any of the Raptors should be, like, blown away that they didn't get the All-Star nod. Like like you said, Fred's probably the most deserving. 
those three all had a chance, but I don't think it's like an indictment or, or like anything crazy that they didn't get in. There's a lot of deserving candidates. Um, in terms of like the all-star game in general, yeah, I don't really, I don't really think it should be happening. Um, but at the same time, like, I'm not sure how, you know, people are still getting on these, on flights and they're going to go to like Barbados and like rent a villa. So it's not like their COVID exposure is like zero, even if they don't go to the game. Um, with that being said, obviously the game is a little bit higher of a chance and it's also just less opportunity to rest. But um, yeah, I would, I would subscribe to the belief that maybe it's a blessing in disguise that none of them are going. Okay, so back to you, Oren. And this is something you and I talked about last year. I specifically remember in a WhatsApp conversation, you and I discussing, is Pascal Siakam the team's best player? Because a lot of the advantages the Raptors had were created by the mismatches he presents. This year, I think Fred Van Vliet, in impact, as far as basically any metric, has leapfrogged him. That might not be the case for the full year over, but what have you thought of the Raptors' two men, Van Vliet, Siakam, in the first half of the season so far? Honestly, like, they've both impressed me, I guess. Like, I hate to pit them against each other in a way, but, yeah, they've both been really, really good. Like, I would agree that Fred has had the better season, but I don't think that makes him a better player. His, like, advanced stats, like Raptor and those kind of things, are absolutely nuts. Like, he really ranks in the top five in a lot of these things, which is crazy. Like, I don't think that means he's a top five player, right? But uh, one thing those stats really value, just for example, is, like, not turning the ball over and assisting your teammates. And Fred has an insanely low turnover percentage. So that's helping him. But yeah, it's like the steals are helping him. The blocks are helping him. Um, but I still think Pascal, I would still say Pascal is better, you know, just in terms of upside. Um, but has he had a better season? No, like he got off to such a bad start that it was always going to be really hard for him to climb out of that hole. Um, but, you know, as we get into these things, like we're going to start talking about trade season and small ball versus should they get a center versus should they get a wing? All of these possibilities in terms of playing small, in terms of adding a wing instead of going after a traditional center, all of these possibilities are in part because Pascal Siakam is a 6'9", 4", who can slide down any position. Obviously, OG deserves credit too in that front court. Like, but Pascal like part of his utility for me comes in the fact that like he can play in so many machinations, 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 um, that that's, that's part of the reason I would, I would probably just have him higher in terms of value to an organization than a guy like Fred. Aiden, do you have any thoughts on the matter? Yeah, I think, I mean, to boil it down, it's just like, I think Siakam's ceiling is just so much higher. Like he, he fits the archetype that basically every general manager fantasizes about every night going to bed. Um, and, and I think interesting enough is like Siakam's defense is blossoming at the same time. So he had a tough start offensively, but um, you know, Boucher was getting a lot of love for like those perimeter blocks, but, but Siakam's right up there. And um, the fact that he can guard one to five and at any moment is just like, it gives him um the kind of value that few players across the league have. One thing that has stuck, stood out to me is that we Raptors fans will always say like, it's OG at the five. Don't say it's Pascal at the five, right? To like people who don't watch that much Raptors. But this season, it's actually been a lot of Pascal defending centers. They've really like bought into that more than they did last year. And he's really held his ground. He's done a good job of that. He's been better as like a rim protector this season. Um, but, like, I'll throw this back to you guys. What do you think about his, I guess, can he be a number one option on a really good playoff team? Because, like, you know, I said yes coming into the season, and then the season started the way it did, and I was like, okay, I need to dial this love back a little bit because <laughs> maybe this is not uh, his best usage. But now he is doing some things that maybe make it, more likely that he could one day be that player. So I'm wondering if you guys have any thoughts on that. So, and the first thing I want to touch on is the OG at the five. The cool thing is that they're both playing good 
help side defense. The rotations are crisp for both of them. It's tough to reorient how you play defense when you haven't typically played a certain style, especially relative to a position. Pascal and OG both seem to have under command the ability to kind of quarterback the defense at the back end, and we've seen that in some games. Although I I do agree, especially offensively, that OG gets matched up with centers, and he, he loves to eat. But as far as Pascal being a number one option on a really good team, I think so. And there's a bunch of different ways that number one options can look. The profile of what a star is has changed a lot, and jump shooting has allowed for that, you know, maybe most of all. But when we think of a guy like Siakam, who I thought last year in the playoffs, despite his offensive struggles, was the third best defender in the NBA at that point in time, his ability to affect a myriad of offenses and looks and actions defensively was, it was incredible. And, you know, we talked about, or sorry, Aiden talked about one through five defending. It, it's not so long that Pascal Siakam was part of the bench mob and was guarding John Wall in a playoff series, or they were just throwing him out to guard Russell Westbrook when Russell Westbrook was still a big deal during regular season. And now he's not getting those matchups from the jump. But if he's switching in action, especially out on the perimeter, he can lock down a Kemba. He could lock down, well, when Kemba was more um, spry, I suppose, he can lock down smaller guards and he can do that stuff in short stretches. And that utility defensively gives you more leeway for what he can be offensively as a first option because, no, he's probably never going to be like a super efficient first option type of guy. He won't get to the Zach Levine level, but impact wise, both sides of the floor, he brings a lot of value to your team. So first option is, it's a tough question, but I think he can provide enough value that he can be the first option on a very good team at some point. Yeah, I, th- I was just going to say or add that the the problem with that question too is like, what is your, your team doing schematically? And <clears throat> if you ask me, is he going to be the next Kawhi or or the the guy that's going to literally drag and pull a team to the finals i don't think that's that's ever going to be siakam but in with a balanced offense like we have so thus far and with multiple threats i think he can be the guy that you go to in the post on switches or the guy that you iso on the wing um in those those last minutes of a game um and no he didn't demonstrate that last uh, playoffs, but I think his his room to grow is immense still. Yeah, and it depends a lot on how the Raptors utilize him. You, you talked about schematically, of course, but if you have Pascal registering above the 85th percentile in pick and roll possessions, you probably have to feed it if you want him to look like a guy you can just give him the ball at the end of the game, ask him to create something off the bounce with screen help. You're going to have to give him more reps. You're going to have to... See, you're going to have to see is the earned percentile something that is that can be repeated over time or is that something that's just buoyed by a couple nice makes or free throws or ability to draw fouls like Norm Powell we've seen this year. Are these plays where he can take advantage of consistently and if you're not running plays where Pascal Siakam can take advantage, then what are you doing? And then that's just, it comes down to how he's being utilized and can anybody be a number one star if they're not being put in the right places to uh, succeed. I I agree with what both you guys are saying. And I would say like Giannis is a good comparison. Obviously he's Mm -hmm. never going to be that good. Mm -hmm. Um, He's like Giannis is generational, but in the sense that like Milwaukee has kind of dialed back the, okay, Giannis, we're going to put the ball in your hands in the last two minutes of games and ask you to do stuff. They've kind of been like, you know, we have guys who have a little more off the bounce game. We'll give it to them at the end of games. But for the other, you know, 45 minutes, you're the guy. I think that's kind of where I am now with Pascal, where I I would be surprised if he ever gets to the point where he's really effective, last two minutes, ISO kind of situations. But I also think that throughout most of the game, like Giannis, he can be, you know, really effective as as the number one option i think he can actually get to a point where he's above average isoing late in games just because the the bar is so low actually like players do not perform well in those situations and i think 
that Siakam has the tools. It's just about what he chooses to do because he does a lot of things. Like he does a lot of things offensively, but most of them are at a middling or average rate. And as soon as he starts to figure out how to mix properly, then we'll see probably better efficiency in some of those things. Just because he does things in trends. Pascal, if he's doing one thing, he'll probably try and do it for like four possessions in a row. If it's working, he'll try and stretch it to seven. If it's not, maybe he doesn't take a shot for eight minutes of gameplay, stuff like that. So anyway. I I wish he was like 10% more of an asshole because like, I just wish he was like a little more aggressive in like hunting mismatches because sometimes he'll go at a guy like Embiid just to be like, it, it seems like just to be like, I don't know, for his own kind of like their own battle they have going on. Meanwhile, he could force a switch onto like a Connaughton and then post him up. And I just wish he did that like 10% more of the time and then rock the baby, you know, and then did like the you're too small thing a little more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it too. Aiden, any final thoughts on Pascal? No, I, I like the comparison of Giannis. I was actually just looking at high usage guys, and I, I weirdly was thinking about Giannis and Van Vliet, Kai Westbrook, and Beal. Like, you kind of have the smooth score off to the side, and then like this relentless attacker at the rim who can do everything but has a little bit trouble um, spotting up. And I know like the analogy is not that tight, but I think like going back to that number one question like I think you can kind of parse off who's responsible for what in the offense and how each kind of um, engenders points or playmaking out of them yeah and I guess Oren would know this since he's a bouncing around listener but when it comes to Giannis Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday it's just about working a little bit harder to put them in the proper spots late in game because those three guys can get you good late game offense it's not all about one guy and the, the Raptors are constantly shifting how they put their guys in the offense to create floor spacing, floor balance, and to create a point of attack that's dangerous and stuff like that. But, okay, a question that is just free roam for both of you guys. <laughs> Oren, we'll go to you first. What is a little-known trend of the Raptors season that you can clue me into? That's right. I'm being selfish. I'm going to take this, and I'm going to write an article about it afterwards. <laughs> Man, okay, do you want, like, more of an X's and O's thing or more, like, a narrative thing? I'll let you guys, because I have two here. Whatever you want, dude. This is, mm-hmm. It's your world, squirrel. I'm just trying to get a nut. Okay, they're, they're actually both kind of cynical, but uh, let's talk, like, a little bit about the depth. Not the, like, I'm cluing you into the fact that this team doesn't have great depth. At least that's my opinion. But um, there is a stat that, like, the Raptors are 1-5, and five, I believe, on, back, on the second end of back-to-backs this season. And then when you compound that with the fact that they might – they like, I would guess that these next three games will be pushed into the second half of the schedule. They already have four sets of back-to-back scheduled in the second half of the schedule, so that will create maybe five, six. Um, I'm a little bit worried. Like, this team – has some really good top end talent but once you get past six, seven eight nine on the depth chart um it's a lot of guys who do similar things and don't really provide a huge scoring punch so the fact that there's back-to-backs along with the fact that there's these covid protocols hitting teams all the time and there's like an influx of muscle injuries all of these things make me a little bit worried seating wise because like on the one hand, the Raptors have an easier schedule. So a lot of people have been like, oh, they'll, they'll get a four seed. You know, they have an easier schedule. They have more home games coming up. And I also think like coaching uh, is in their favor because I think that could factor pretty big when, when we're dealing with, you know, injuries and all these things. But I'm a little bit worried when it comes to just the lack of depth on this team. Um, when guys have had to step up and play a role bigger than they're used to this season, it has not gone very well. Last season was kind of the opposite where the next man up mentality was really like, you know, working in their favor when guys had to step up a little bit, they could, because I don't know, maybe just there was a system around them that was a little more clearly defined and roles were a little more clearly defined this season. Um, that back-to-back stat haunts me a little bit because, you know, I'm just curious to see how they can work around um, the kind of like 
fact that their bench pieces are, are usually more often than not one way pieces who can either defend or can score and not really do the other. So yeah, I guess I'm, w- I'm wondering what you guys think about that concern. Aiden, I'll let you take this one. I, I just say like, it's early in the season, like just release the hounds, you know, like <laughs> I, I growing in Victoria, I was the, the biggest Nash fan and I despised Antoni because the whole season he'd go seven deep, to eight tops. Like sometimes Eric Pietkowski would get minutes or something. And then come playoffs, Nash is totally exhausted. They send somebody out there like a young Dragic or something, and they don't know what to do in these, these like high intensity um, slog fests of the playoffs. And I think like a big mistake, right? It's not a big mistake, but I, I lament that Nurse is not more liberal with some of these guys like i i mean i'm a huge stanimal stan i like i want to see him and davis and like macaw and yuda and i wanted to see them unleashed and yeah they're gonna fail a little bit but when nurse was out last game scariola was in he rolled like four bench and a, and a lowry and a four bench and and van vliet and the van vliet four bench wasn't that great it was trouble but with lowry it was quite strong and i think like these are valuable minutes to kind of hone that raw talent or that raw athleticism you will have on the bench to see who can really like evolve over the course of the season. Cause that's what we did with the bench mob. And now lo and behold, you know, Siakam and Van Vliet are, are one and two on our team, you know? So I just want to see nurse be like, have a longer leash with some of these guys. It is, it is interesting. You could throw anybody out there with Kyle Lowry. It's a, a common joke is Kyle Lowry plus, you know, a a mop and a broomstick gets you, you know, a plus seven net rating or whatever over their minutes for a season. And yeah, the Fred plus bench units have been a lot less successful than that. That's the, that's something he hasn't transcended yet. Maybe never will, but I do agree with you, Oren is I don't look at this team and say, Oh, they're super deep. Like I do like, I love Yuta. I love Bembry and I love Stan, the defenders three very good but of those three i think deandre is the only guy who has more than eight minutes of utility per game in a playoff setting unless there's a matchup that's really advantageous for one of yuda or stan it's tough to look at this team and think that there's good minutes but also to aiden's point you have to try and find stuff and you can see a lot of other teams in the nba are more liberal with the minutes that they hand out and sometimes they're rewarded with it. The Raptors clearly need more off the bounce, pull up, wiggle. And Paul Watson, we, I don't think it would hurt too bad to give him some more on ball reps, see what's happening. See if he can get you six points in the third quarter every once in a while. Who cares, right? Try it out. But on the other hand, the Raptors have been playing from behind this year and they, you know, they're trying to win as many games as possible. So Trying to get back to 500, maybe we'll see it a little bit more lenient from here on out. But I, I do agree with you that there is reason to be cynical, Oren. Aiden, what's your trend, mate? All right. It's not as um, meticulous as you may suggest, but um, you know, I was looking at all of the ways in which Toronto scores its points, and um, they're virtually identical to last year. Um, and... That's concerning to me because, again, when you you get to the playoffs, things just change drastically, right? Like the pace of games slow down, um, the like how methodical you are on offense is really important, right? There isn't there's less of this flow and free ranging offense, um, and this year points scored on twos were twenty eighth, points scored on threes were third, you know. Um, we're, we're last in post-ups points in the paint were 28th and and the list goes on and they're quite similar to last year but for points in the paint and post and this is you know not so enlightening but um we don't have that we not only do not have a post presence but we're I, we're getting to the rim and scoring um at a rate that's concerning moving forward and so um I don't know what the answer is because this is how we thrive and this is kind of how the new NBA operates. Um, But I, yeah, 
I'm just, I'm just concerned the same way that Oren is. Like, I am a little bit cynical about this team's chances moving into the playoffs and battling um, upper echelon teams. We could call I, ourselves the cynical three. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Uh, Aiden, <laughs> the point you make is one that has been providing, I think, the people paying attention with some level of stress over the year. I think that is just part and parcel of handing so much of the offense to Fred Van Vliet, though. This is what, and I, I do mean that, this is what Fred Van Vliet does. He passes out of drives more than any other player in the NBA. He does not get to the rim at a level that is, you know, comparative to other guards who, have, who are on ball a similar amount. He shoots a lot of threes himself, which is very good. The pull-up is coming along. The relocation has always been fantastic. But Fred, by and large, creates three-point shots for teammates. He does not lead his teammates to the basket. He does not lead them close to the basket. And he has a lot of possessions on this team. With Pascal Siakam, there's very little in the way of screen help. That is the best way to get him downhill. They ISO him at the 45 extended and expect rim pressure to come from that. There's just... The way they orient their offense, I don't think is meant to create rim pressure. And then they seem to be frustrated when they can't get it. And it's like, you can't just do transition. And transition is great, but you can't just push hard, see if a lane opens up, or rely on OG Ananobi to pick off every above-the-break pass, point to wing, wing wing to point, and say, look how many points in the paint we have. You, You have to try and get guys going downhill. And more often than not, screen help wise Fred is the guy most often going downhill but he takes a left or a right turn and the 45 cut on the opposite side is not being made baseline cuts are being covered because Fred doesn't draw as many defenders and that's that's just what this is the the offense is not built to provide rim pressure and that's why Kyle Lowry was basically the only guy who was able to do it in the Celtics series Fred could not Pascal could not, and Kyle was the guy taking screens, getting downhill, using his guile, jump stops, and the like to to manipulate help side defenders into stepping out of spots so he could find guys in the dunker spot or getting up for layups. And that's Kyle's genius, of course. But the Raptors just don't have a bevy of players. And even if they did, like Siakam, they're not putting him in a position to get downhill without putting a huge burden of creation on him. So or in, I'm interested what you think, but I just don't think they're in a spot to do it in a, in very well. And if they wanted to, Siakam's the guy. Yeah, I mean, um, it's complicated. Like, I would agree with Aiden on the the transition stuff. Like, to me, they're relying too much on transition, just like we saw last season and we saw it befuddle them in the playoffs. Like, this group that we've come to really like the small ball group with Pascal and OG in the front court, they're turning people over on 21% of possessions. So it's like a ridiculous stat. And then like they're scoring off steals at a ridiculous rate. And that's a large reason why their offense has been so good. Um, But then I'll, I would also like push back a little bit on the idea that the half court offense hasn't really seen uh, differences that can be, applied to the playoffs because like for one thing Pascal and Fred have both developed a pretty reliable mid-range jumper I think that's significant in the playoffs that could have been used against the Celtics you know who are kind of just protecting the rim and and leaving that area pretty open um so so that's one thing I would also maybe push back on the post-up idea like Pascal has really developed as a playmaker and out of the post up specifically is probably his best avenue to create for teammates. And that's, I think a pretty good source of offense in the playoffs. It might not be a great source of rim pressure, but it is like this team is like you said, it's not really built to put pressure on the rim. It's filled with shooters and their best offense comes from spot ups. And so I think in the playoffs, you'll see them go to Pascal in the post um, doubles come and then from there it's it's pretty easy picking um, but in terms of the screen help yeah I have no answer like we'd all love to see it a little bit more um, maybe my only really thought is that 
Nurse does not want to be too predictable in the sense that some teams just spam pick and roll and you stop that, you stop their offense, and maybe Nurse doesn't want to fall into that trap. But um, I would definitely like to see the Raptors run more pick and roll. <laughs> well, we yeah. all would. Yeah, go ahead. One thing I wanted to add is that what's also interesting is they, they're basically last in the league scoring in the middle of the shot clock, and they're quite high at scoring at the end of shot clocks in the beginning. So I'm kind of wondering if a little bit, a little bit of this is strategy of like – um, creating, you know, that frantic kind of environment for a defense and wearing them down um, through, you know, attacks and kicks and swings um, so as to kind of compensate for the lack of, like, a direct scoring threat and to try and wear the defense down. It's one thought. I, it's, it's, you know, that's one reach I'm having. I will – I don't do this often but I'll disagree. I'm not a big take guy, but I think that's just Van Vliet, Lowry, Siakam. They do not go, like, like we've been talking about in this conversation, a bunch of teams have primary action, bucket, or miss. Bradley Beal, for example, you run a pick and roll, he sees what he can do, he scores or he doesn't. There's, there's some playmaking bent to his game, of course, but for example, that's one way. The Raptors don't have guys who just take a screen get to their spot and hit. And they don't spam that, as, as Orn was saying. The early shot clock stuff is grab-and-go game. Of course, the late shot clock stuff is just because the Raptors have to attack a couple closeouts in a row to create advantages because their primary ball handlers aren't getting a bunch of screen help, aren't creating incredible advantages off the jump. I think they have to attack a couple advantages to open up the shot that they want because they don't have any, for lack of a better term, heliocentric force. A guy who can just come in, take possessions. You know, we talked about Kawhi earlier. A guy who just comes in, takes that screen, gets to his spot, scores a bucket. There's quite a few guys in the league who do that now. None of them play for the Toronto Raptors. And, Oren, you did bring up, you know, there's a mid-range game that's burgeoning with Pascal, with Fred, but it's still not to the degree that... uh I think it would lend itself to that type of offense, but that would be my take on that. I think Aiden. Yeah, fair enough. I, 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 I mean, that's kind of the long way around. And my point is that they don't have that immediate action or that immediate like um, bailout in the event that things are going wrong. And so it's, yeah, I'm, there's more of a um, war of attrition going on with ball movement, but yeah, you're probably right that it's just because we don't have that primary option. No, like, I, I think it's a good point in the sense of, like, you look at, like, this team is pretty well prepared to, I guess, have one guy like a Pascal or a Kyle sits and they still win games. And I think it's because it is such a, like, free-flowing offense. It doesn't depend on any one person too much. Um, but when you get to the playoffs, you don't really – that's that's not as valuable, right? You want one person to bail you out or one play type to bail you out when you really need a bucket. And I agree, they don't really have that. It's uh, The free-flowing thing is that playoff basketball is more segmented. Rarely does it open up the same way that regular season basketball can, especially late in the fourth quarter and stuff like that. So, But, the, you know, that's part and parcel of playoff basketball. But, okay, we'll take a break, and then we'll, we'll be right back. Hey, everyone. I want to tell you about Blue Wire Hustle a brand new program where you can host your very own podcast here at Blue Wire. Hustle was created to give everyone the opportunity to take their podcast to the next level. Or if you want to host a podcast and just don't know where to start, Hustle is the perfect place for you. As part of the program, you'll receive personal cover art, Q&As with Blue Wire's top podcasters, access to our community discord, and an e-learning course full of tips and tricks. And on top of that, we'll help you get your show pushed to Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, and all other listening platforms. And the best part is, you can get all this for only $15 a month. The same rate as any other hosting site would charge you just for the initial setup. So, whether you're starting from scratch, or have an existing show that you want to grow, Hustle is an open door to leveling up your sports podcasting experience. Acceptance into the program is limited, so get your application in today. To apply, go to bwhustle.com slash join. Check out the description box for this episode to find out more, but that's bwhustle.com slash join. 
Welcome back from your ad read, my ad read, your ad break. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we're talking about basketball still. Oren Weisfeld, Aiden Moss, two wonderful minds, and here we are discussing the great game of basketball. Okay, Kyle Lowry, a hero, day man, all the, all the things you want to apply to him. He's great, loved in Toronto. There's been a lot of stress, frustration in, from the fan base at other teams, you know, trying to poach him when they seemingly don't even have a credible source. They don't have a credible trade candidate that they can put out that would provide any value. Clippers, we're looking at you. There's just a lot of talk about Kyle Lowry being traded and the Raptors are supposed to be like, well, we, we can't get anything back for him. He's just going to have to go win another team a title and that's what happens. Kyle Lowry's gone. Like we're supposed to take that in stride or something. He's still really good. If he had played every game, there's, there's a case that he might have been an all-star this year. But with that said, I don't care about the trade talk. I want to talk about the on-court stuff. I'll go to you first, Oren. What have your thoughts been on Kyle Lowry's on-court performance this year? Um, he's been really good. I mean, like, my eye test originally kind of told me that he's been a little more inconsistent than previous years. Um, but I'm kind of surprised to see his numbers be what they are. Like his true shooting is the highest almost of his career. He's at like 618 right now. Um, he is one of those players that I think is a feel player. I guess you could describe it that way. You may take issue with that, but in the sense that if he has to take a couple games off, it'll often take him a few games to get back in the rhythm of things. And I think we've seen that this year because I think he's had two absences now. And I mean, this absence, he's come back and absolutely just fired away. But the one before that, um, it took him some games to kind of get back in the, the feel of things, especially with his shooting. But um, he, you know, I think he's had to adjust to no fault of his own in to play like different ways. And the good thing about Kyle is that he can play really any role you ask of him. But at the start of the season, he was more of a scorer with Pascal and Norm not really providing that. And now with those guys going, he's really sitting back a little bit more. I think last game was a perfect example of this, the Houston game. And he just kind of directed stuff and just said, like, you know what? I'll be a playmaker. I'll score when we're in a little bit of a rut and we really need a basket. But I think that's his best usage on this team. Not only, maybe not even in the sense that, like, that's the way to win the most games, but definitely in the developmental sense, because, like, I think we'd all agree that this is not a championship team. So they should have an eye towards the future. And Kyle, you know, taking like 25 shots a game is not ideal for an eye towards the future. So I think recently, as this team figures stuff out, they have put him in a really good role for him, which is more of like a playmaker. Ask him to do a little bit less offensively. Also helps in terms of fatigue, because we know we're putting a lot of miles on him this, this season. The only like negative thing I, I guess I have to say is his turnover percentage is pretty high. I think you can blame that on Biggs. I, I'm not going to blame it on Kyle too much. He is playing with the guy in Aaron Baines who doesn't have the greatest hands to be nice. And the other thing I'm kind of surprised looking at is his win-loss splits. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but he's just playing dramatically better in wins. <laughs> like He's shooting 55% in wins from the field and 40% on more field goal attempts uh, in losses. He's minus 3.9 in losses and plus 11.9 in wins. So I think that's maybe something that you want to improve on. I guess you want, I guess that goes back to my point that he has been a little more inconsistent than in, in years past. Um, but overall, he's still providing a ton of value and I would like to keep him forever. Okay, I'll do a little sidebar first because in my head, after you said the Aaron Baines thing, I've written a short story, a short film as it were, and I'll describe it. Aaron Baines returns home, opens the door. You see everything inside is smashed. It's broken. 
He looks disheartened. He looks like he's he's grief struck. The couch, the leg is missing. It's helter skelter in there. Coffee mugs are broken all over the place. And you see him walk over to the sink. He turns on the water and you see him reach for a mug and immediately smashes it against the floor. And then he just hangs his head. And suddenly you realize, oh, he broke all the stuff in his house. He wasn't robbed. He broke it all. But anyway, yeah, Kyle, I think it's, it's interesting because his free throw rate and his rim frequency down, but how much of that is related to who his pick and roll or pick and pop partners are, right? If he's able to get the help side defender out of the paint with a guy like Mark or Serge last year, getting to the rim is a little bit easier. And if it really depends, if he's playing against strictly drop bigs who are dropping against a mark or surge last year, are they a little bit less mobile? Is he able to get them off their feet or into bad positions? Or is he just attacking a guy who's coming over, rotating the weak side, which rotations foul a lot more than guys who are just playing strictly drop defense. So that that's all in play. But from watching, I would say he's just a little bit less aggressive getting downhill, which fine. The whole team has been a little bit more jumper heavy. Kyle's taking more free throw. Sorry, Kyle's taking more mid range. And he's still probably when he's at his best, one of the most creative and influential players in the NBA. And my God, he's so much fun to watch. Aiden, do you have any Kyle Lowry takes? Yeah. uh, My hot take is like, if Lowry was traded to a different team every year, he would get as much praise as CP3 gets. Like, (laughs) He has that effect on teams, and that's why there's trade rumors for base, virtually every playoff contender in the league is he literally can fit any kind of mold, and he understands – not only can he fit it, but he understands how to fit it and how to augment those people around him. Um, you know, and so I think like, – like it's kind of surprising. I was just looking at usage, but he basically shares the same usage rate as Siakam and Van Vliet even though on eye test, you kind of see that he's, he is taking that step back. Um, so I, I'll never have anything negative to say about Lowry. Like you can't measure, you know, I'll take the intangible approach. You can't measure his command or like his resilience or the control. And that's something that's kind of a newer evolution of Lowry, right? Like I don't ever want to really harken back to the DeRozan Lowry days, but, but he wasn't known for that kind of measure. And um, now, now that's just what you're going to get in every game. Like when he steps back onto the court, you know, he's going to resume control over the tempo and the, um, and what's going on on both ends of the court. Not to mention that like defensively watching how he uses his body, not even his hands, not even necessarily, um, like position well yeah positionally just like you just watch how he moves his body and how he thinks about where the ball is going to be and where he needs to be to disrupt that it's not always resulting in a steal or a strip but um i don't know yeah it's just so much fun to watch because you can see that like meta mind operating all the time i was going to add to Oren's stats that are kind of interesting is that his top 10 scoring performances the Raptors are only four uh four and six and then um his but they're but the Raptors are nine and one in his top 10 plus minus performances so it's like the Raptors don't necessarily need him to score they just need him to be that like foundational anchor um that he provides for the team I would suspect that's related to rim pressure as well because I'd be interested to see what like his assist percentage is in those games. That's something I could look up, but what you spoke about defensively as far as getting to spots, I think my favorite thing that I could describe Kyle Lowry is that on offense, he lets the ball do all the work and still looks like he's doing everything. And on defense, he's capable of getting to spots in two steps where most players take three. And it's just, He's gamed the system. He understands the permutation of so many different actions. If you're running corner, he knows how to shade properly. If he's on the weak side, he knows how to cover two guys instead of one when they're zoning up. It's the same thing. And he does it all at, you know, a very reduced size relative to most of his contemporaries in the NBA and just a genius on the court. And basically 
allowing him to interpret the game as often as possible will leave you with a bunch of advantages, I think. His assist percentage, I think they're five and five with his top 10 assist percentage performances. I mean, there's obviously other factors and stuff. Egg on my face, Aiden. Well, who knows? <laughs> he could still be. Oren, any, any thoughts? Um, not really. Like, I think that, that kind of makes sense that the Raptors don't win that much when he is basically like their number one scorer. Um, I think that's played out in many, many years. We've, we have learned that he's not best used as a number one scoring option. Um, and that's fortunately why like Fred and Pascal have developed into the players. They are, um, they, they like, I th- I don't even think Kyle really wants to be the number one scoring option. That's the only real like difference I see in his game than a guy like Chris Paul is that I think Chris Paul's a little bit more reliable as a scorer, especially late in games. Mm. Um, but, but like, that's not really an indictment. That's just Kyle's probably better used as a playmaker and doing all the little things he does. And also the only other thing I've noticed, I don't know if you guys have is like, it feels to me like he's playing slower. Like in years past, you would see Kyle you know, make or miss. He's always looking up. He's always pushing the ball. And this year just feels to me like he's, you know, selectively playing in transition. But I've also noticed that when Kyle's not there, because, you know, he's had two absences this season, their transition game is are in ruts. Like they, mm-hmm. they need him as a playmaker in transition um, but the numbers also bear that out. He's he, he's playing in transition like 5% less than he did last year. So I think that's a little interesting just in terms of pace. I like Pascal with Pascal and Kyle. Obviously, Kyle is the, the number one guy you want handling the ball in transition. But I like Pascal as a ball handler in transition better than I do Fred Van Vliet. Mainly because oh. Fred is so valuable spacing out. And Pascal to Fred... There's been a lot of threes hit this year with Pascal's grab-and-go game where he's got the ball, taking it up the floor. He can occupy two lanes at once in transition just because of the perceived rim pressure he's going to provide in transition. He can get to the bucket. Teams do drop low. Oftentimes, a second guy will kind of, he'll pinch over to Pascal, and Fred has hit a lot of those above the break threes. And when and Fred is famously... Uh, not very pass heavy in transition. He likes to take it all the way to the bucket and the results are maybe not always that good. But yeah, that is interesting. Lowry has been a little bit more selective with his spurts, I would say. Yeah, and the bench guys are also completely out of sorts in transition. Like I've seen Utah or Terrence Davis, like Bembry's really good in transition, but the other guys, like I've seen them pass it to Boucher and just be like, okay, do it now. You do it <laughs> like so many times and he'll just take a charge or like he'll be just in not a position to lay the ball up and have to take like a weird floater. Like those guys need to be better with their decision making. I think we've seen probably Stan and Yuta, we've probably seen close to or their best game so far this season. Bembry, I think has a lot more in the bag. And I think he, he just because he's really, really clever, especially how he moves within the defense. And offensively, he's got a great nose for cuts, 45, baseline, whatever. And as you say, transition, his reads are good as well. I think he's the guy that they've picked up that they say, this guy can kind of hang with the team for a while. We'll see what he becomes. Because Atlanta, just because of how they constructed their roster, they gave up on him a little bit early. And they went a different way. But I think Bembry is still brimming with positive value. But, okay. Aiden, do you have any, any thoughts before we move on to the last question? No, uh, that's great. Okay. We'll start with you, Aiden. What have been your low and high points of the season so far? <laughs> Very simplistic, I know. But, you know, give me a break, really. <laughs> well, you know, I was thinking about it a little bit. And the thing is, is that I'm, I'm kind of numb to this year. Like... I don't know that I've really had any major lows or highs just because my expectations were measured coming into this. Like I've accepted that this is a little bit of a passing of the guard. This is a little bit of a, we've paid all of our young core. Let's see what they have and let's watch them grow into how we've projected them. So 
with that being said, like when we went two and eight, I wasn't devastated. And when all my friends were messaging me, like, what the hell is going on? I'm like, guys, this is just going to be part and parcel, you know? One thing that was a low for me, and I think it was more just like personal trauma, was um, <laughs> blowing those two games against Golden State and Portland. And it's like, well, other than the fact that before that, on a four game stretch, we gave up like 123 points. But that Golden State game, like Curry was two for 16, Wiggins was seven for 17, and Ubre was five for 15, and we still lost. And it just felt so much like the Casey, Casey and days, the Dwayne Casey and days of like just never being able to hold a lead and playing supreme basketball for a quarter or two or even three. And then when it comes down to it, we just don't have the execution or the, the go to two guy even though Siakam was literally like that one my micro finish away from scoring that and same with Portland um even though the circumstances were different so that was my low in the sense of like oh god are we gonna have five or six years of top three Eastern Conference finishes and then just get completely smashed out of the first or second round because we don't have those guys that you can go to in the final two or three minutes so that was that was kind of my lowest point of the year for whatever reason I was in a similar spot. The two and eight didn't really matter just because I knew certain aspects of the team were going to come around. And you can honestly, if anybody wanted to hear my low points, just mind the Raptors reaction podcast after every game and see if you can find them. But I I didn't think there were that many. My high points, though, I think was the Pacers game where OG had 30. Watching OG hunt, guard, big, switches is like I can I can hardly express how awesome that is to see OG Ananobi doing and watching him transition from okay Sabona switched off me now I've got Brogdon welcome to the post your meat I'm gonna eat you up was was awesome and you know watching him come from that left baseline and just body slam guys before going up and he's done it against semi Ojale he's done it against Demona Sabonis he's done it against big guys he doesn't do it against little guys because I think he knows he'll catch like a murder charge, which smart. But he that game was really fun for me. I enjoyed it immensely. And that that baseline attack where he moved Sabonis like three feet was virtually the equivalent of when Zion exploded Gobert last night. Like it was mm-hmm. just it looked so um and antithetical to how I think human physics work. It was incredible. That is, that is what OG is, I think, at the end of the day, antithetical to how humans work. Just the, he is, uh, yeah, I used the term before, but syncopated. There, there's no rhythm to OG Ananobi. He is just destruction and then spot-up shooting. There, there's no rhythm to anything he's doing and disruption on defense. But Oren, any thoughts? Hi, hello. Yeah, I'm more emotional than you guys. I I came in. (laughs) He says in like a monotone (laughs) voice. (laughs) The voice, you know, the voice and the facial features don't define me. I have emotions too. Um, (laughs) But yeah, like I had high expectations for this team, I guess, coming into the season. And I was pretty surprised with the two and eight start. Though I did see them figuring some things out and kind of riding the ship. It was still disappointing. So the low point of the season was um, the first Boston game when Jason Tatum dropped 40 on us and Peyton Pritchard drops way too many points on us as well because not only was it like another loss early in the season, it was also like, God damn it, how do we stop this team? Like that team, honestly, I, I picked them not to – I just didn't think they were going to be that good. So not to toot my own horn, but I didn't like their depth – and but with that being said they match up really nicely against us from their perspective because Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, or even a guy like Boucher um, is really lethal and they're a smart enough team to I mean they really do the opposite as nurse where they'll really spam pick and roll if they think that's the option to win the game like and they've done it against us now for a couple years in a row where they just target our big men and they just play them almost off the floor. And so that kind of was a down point just in the sense of like, how are we going to stop this team going forward? If not for a change of personnel. Um, 
Orn, I have a quiz for you. Over, under, a number of threes. Semi Ojale scored that game. Number is five. Over, under. Semi Ojale? Uh-huh. Under. I'm talking about the first Boston game. Oh, you, oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. I, My that was the Peyton Pritchard game. Fast um, PP. Right, right, right. Thing. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. Semi killed us the next game. He still had three threes that game, though, too. Surprise. Right. Sorry. sorry, my bad. No worries. Um, but yeah, the, the high point for me was I think it was the first Milwaukee game. Uh, and we recently played them, the first of the back to back, when we won and Fred shaked. He, mm. he really shaked um, Giannis out of his boots there. So that, that game was beautiful because really it was all of our core players just having one of the better games of their seasons in the same game and being a team that we think of as maybe one of the favorites in the East. Uh, One that didn't appear to match up very well with us because we play so small and they're so big Um, and the Raptors beat them twice in a row. So that was, that was a high point. That's you bring up some of the most important things I think about in the NBA, as far as the, the Raptors Celtics stuff, the Celtics put a lot of pressure above the break, similar to the heat and the Raptors can get trapped in actions above the break. It's just bad news. And Daniel Tice, Robert Williams, Tristan Thompson, they look so much worse against other teams that can get downhill more often than the Raptors. But when Daniel Tice is who he's mobile against the Raptors offense, that works very well. And where he's not a super dominating, just help side big at the rim, that doesn't matter as much against the Raptors, especially when the Raptors aren't getting those types of looks. The Celtics, they just, they match up so well and spamming pick and roll. I definitely see that. But I, man, OG, Pascal, Pascal had a great offensive game, especially his process against the Bucks in that one. And OG kind of neutering the Chris Middleton Giannis actions late in game that was awesome to see and obviously Fred shook our guy Giannis, Giannis Antetokounmpo used the rim to guard against that left-handed layup and then you could see Thanasis in the background and made like a, a stink face because Giannis got got tell us I think on the on the recent low post Zach called Thanasis more of a bowling ball than a basketball <laughs> player <laughs> which is good uh I have a, my hot can I share my high yeah yeah my high is uh, I'm just going to toot Stanley Johnson's horn one more time. My high is the discovery of Stanley Johnson. I, I'm convinced he can be the next Tony Allen. He's, he's shooting 40% on one and a half threes a game. Uh, he's only still 24. His draft comp was Kawhi. He, you watch him on, on the tops of zones. He's like befuddling smaller guards and then you see him guarding Sabonis or Ben Simmons at the same time um and my my other advocacy for him is that you know I think big guard types we see this often take a long time especially him being kind of like a forward guard tweener like he doesn't really know what he is offensively and he may never be but if Tony Allen is his best his highest ceiling like I am all for that and like you know guys like Josh Jackson who are seeing in Detroit finally starting to pull it all together like I, I think there is uh there's hope and promise for Stan Amal. so that's been my high point of the year I appreciate Stan optimism I really do he he's very good at stunting stunt and recover I yeah. may be the best on the roster which is funny because Bambury is really good at flowing through the defense and recovering from like, if the, if the switch, so let's say a guy has to rotate over and there's, there's a rotation that's two rotations over, Bambury is really good at covering to that spot. Stan is really good at point of attack and stunting. And Yuda is maybe the best closeout guy in the NBA. So the defenders three all bring something very good. But the offense, yeah. He, he needs a swing skill. 100% Stanley Johnson needs something to pop off that he can do well because the passing is above average for, his, for what he looks like, right? He's above average for his size as a passer, and, but he's just not doing it at the level where he would dictate more of the ball comes to him so that they're looking for him to play make. He's not dangerous enough off the dribble. If the shooting comes around, 
then closeouts come harder. He can put the ball on the ground and the passing gets even more dangerous. So something has to break offensively, but I do like the optimism for him because he's still young. Yeah. I like him up to small ball five. I'd like to, I think, I think the Raptors have a pretty interesting decision. Blake wrote about it at the athletic where like, also they never get compared to the last year's Rockets, but I think it's a pretty good comparison who just traded Clint Capella at the deadline for another wing. I think that's a possibility for this team. And if they do a thing like that, you could look to someone like Johnson to play backup five without Baines being in the rotation anymore. Yeah. The, Interesting. Um, I was listening to the, or I forget what game it was, but the announcer for the other team called Stanley OG. And it, I mean, oh, all the time, dude. <laughs> and I get it, you know, like they're twins essentially. I mean, if you have those two and Siakam just rotating on the back end, like, I, I don't know, I get excited about that idea. Stan, yeah, the, he provides a lot of utility in unique schemes, I think. And especially with a coach like Nick Nurse, who is maybe a little bit less, uh, I don't know, adventurous offensively, but has clearly shown a very, very adventurous bent as far as what he's willing to throw out defensively. And you know what, Stan? He can pick guys up. Like, there's, there's fake pick guys up players like Russell Westbrook and Pat Bev. If they pick you up in the backcourt, you're like, okay, dude, like, please leave me alone. You're not going to steal the ball. But there's real pick you up guys like Stan and TJ McConnell. If they're on you in the backcourt, you're having a panic attack. You're like, oh, my God, dude, please leave me alone. I don't want any of this business right now. And so I think yeah. that's an attitude shift. Like I think for a long time, being a high prospect at Arizona, he you thought he was going to be the guy, you know. And now, whatever he's been humbled or leadership with the Raptors, but he's finally figured out that he's just got to be be that T.J. McConnell dude on the team. He's he's famously what is that quote where he said he was in LeBron's head as they were getting swept. I <laughs> I just love the confidence, man. It's incredible, and he's not. He has that like half-ass Euro step that he drew a bunch of offensive fouls. Well, he had a bunch of offensive fouls for the first three years of his career, and he doesn't really do that anymore. He's he's mixing up his footwork when he's going downhill. So, yeah, appreciate the Stanimal. Uh, use Stan the Johnson earlier. I really like Stan the Johnson. I think that's an incredible <laughs> nickname, maybe better than Stanimal. But I think we're at the end of the podcast, Aiden. Oren, uh, I'll let you guys fight it out, but feel free to plug away whatever you're looking to plug. First of all, Samson's doing a ton of good work. You guys should follow all of that. I love, I'm a big fan of bouncing around. I'm a big fan of minute, minute basketball. Is that, I don't know. You could kill me if that's not how you prefer it to be pronounced. Is that? It's, it's whatever. It's in the eye of the beholder. We wanted it to be both because minute, because it, you can listen to the audio version of the newsletter and it doesn't take up a lot of your time. You can read it quickly and minute because we're typically diving a little bit deeper on the more minute aspects of basketball. I think that's that's what we go for. But you can call it either. I'm just glad you call it something. Just don't call okay. me late for dinner. Okay, <laughs> kill me. Okay. Well, I'm a, I'm a fan of those two uh, pieces of content. Um, for myself, appreciate it. If you gave me a follow on Twitter, at Oren Weisfeld. And... Um, I recently wrote a pretty fun story, I think, about basically Raptors Twitter and something that happened this winter where a lot of people came together and basically raised about $10,000 for food banks in Toronto. And um, that was initiated by someone named Sidra, um, part of Dishes and the Dimes podcast. So yeah, if you go to my Twitter, you'll see that pinned tweet is the article about it. It's a fun piece. So... Yeah, that's it. That's it for me. Aiden. Well, actually, before I go to Aiden, I, I will say, listener, Oren has taken a little bit more of a risque turn on Twitter lately, too. So he actually has some very entertaining tweets, <laughs> as far as I would say. So not only, not only great pieces that you'll find on his timeline that he's written, but a, a gem of comedy every once in a while. Aiden, the floor is yours, mate. I'll reiterate Oren's sentiment. I, uh, you don't hear often binge reading, but I have been binge reading Samson's deep dives on the Raptors. And, and it's like, you're at a technical level that I'm amazed by. And I, I really appreciate the value you bring to that analysis. Um, on, on my end, 
I write for a website called benchboss.ai. Uh, it's once a week. I'm, my voice has kind of been discovered as highlighting dudes that aren't normally talked about in the grander NBA sphere. So I got a piece on Thaddeus Young, on TJ McConnell, on some uh, uh, Yudas out there, Stanimal and Boucher. So yeah, give me a read if you're interested in that. And that's about it for me. You can call follow me on Twitter at the Gentle Watch, but uh, you know I'm not that active on it yet. So, wow! I first of all, both you guys, thank you so much for the compliments that have been paid. That's that's really nice. I appreciate that. As far as I read your Thaddeus Young piece, but obviously we're on the same wavelength with T.J. McConnell and Yuta. I think I need to read your your T.J. piece, and I think you need to read my Yuta piece, and we need to talk about it. But both there's a reason I had both you guys on. I think you both do great work. Just discovering more of yours, Aiden. Quite familiar with Orens from you know some time, but both. Can I just guys, jump in real quick? Yeah, not to yeah. Interrupt, but um, also like I think Raptors Republic is doing really good work, and I totally forgot to plug the fact that I'm co-hosting with Sahal this post-game show that goes live after every game on YouTube. So follow Raptors Republic on YouTube and Twitter and on the website because I think we're doing. Pretty good work. Okay, if, always free to plug Raptors Republic. And I, I do I do recommend, not only because they, they saved my hide twice now, but uh, the, the YouTube show that goes up after, I think, Oren and Sahal, they, they both do a fantastic job. Two-man banter is a, a very good thing. I think that they provide a very good back and forth and they complement each other extremely well. And maybe even more so than we've all been complimenting each other at the end here. So listener, I hope you've enjoyed, <laughs> enjoyed that. But Aiden, Oren, thank you so much for your time, guys. Thanks, dude. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right. And listener, I hope you enjoyed it. But whether you got into it in the morning or at night, have a blessed day and goodbye. 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 Goodbye.